Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Keeping Your Business Together in a Crisis live stream webinar series. This is part seven of the series titled Spending Your PPP Money. We are recording this session at 10 o'clock a.m. on Wednesday, May 6th. This series is produced by Boulder Small Business Development Center to support businesses in Boulder County and statewide. Um, we are one of 15 SBDCs in Colorado. We all work as a great network. Uh, we are hosted by the city of Boulder and we're part of you know, an organization of local, state, and national strategic partners that can help you during these challenging times. If you're dialing in from Durango, as an example, because I know that people across the state are dialing into this webinar, um, we, again, have a great support system with all of our SBDCs to help you get through uh, the questions that you have. You know, in today's session, it's PPP, but it could be a workout plan or something that um, helps you get through, uh, get through these times. Uh, and the ways that we do that, we have consulting at no cost to you. We do workshops. Now they're mostly online, but uh, mostly after, you know, when things get back to normal, they'll be in person as well. And we do connections to resources. Uh, please note we have everyone on mute, but we are taking questions and there will be a live uh, Q&A after my co-moderator, Jamie Brandis, who you can see in the top uh, top of the screen is going to be uh, asking those questions. So you can put them in chat. I know that some of you have dialed in sp with specific things that you want to know about. Go ahead and uh, put them in the chat while our presenters are speaking. And uh, you will receive a link tomorrow to the recording of this webinar, as well as any attachments or tools that the presenters um, mentioned that they um, would like to share. So at this time, I would like to thank, um, gratefully thank, the uh, presenters today, Brian Ormsby from Pantheon Solutions and Dan King, who is the uh, ambassador of Cool and has done many businesses. They are both our uh, lead SBDC, uh, SBDC COVID subject matter experts. And um, I'm gonna let them take it over because we've got a lot to talk about today. So Dan and Brian, take it away. Cool. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, we're gonna we're gonna try to review the um, PPP and really focus on loan forgiveness. How you get maximum loan forgiveness? I'm gonna tell you that we're gonna give you the answers we know. We're gonna talk about many areas that we just don't know yet. Um, the guidance from the SBA is still incomplete. I know that many of our clients are, are frustrated. They call their banks. They try to get direct answers. Nobody will give them a direct answer because nobody has the direct answer from the from the federal government yet. So people are making assumptions. We'll we'll try to give you our best advice, but we'll also let you know when it's, when it's just advice based on our, our best assumptions versus something that we actually officially know. So really quick to, to review the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, it sounded pretty simple in the beginning. Um, it was a program that was designed to cover payroll cost, most mortgage interest payments, rent and utility cost. Those were the categories of expenses that you could put up against this loan to get forgiveness. And you had to spend that money in an eight week period that started on the day that you received the funds from the loan. Um, there were three major tests that were gonna allow you to get 100% forgiveness. Those tests were that you basically had to maintain your historic levels of payroll dollar numbers. In fact, you had to spend a little bit more, but essentially the same as you did in the past. You had to maintain your employee head counts to what they were historically. And you could only spend the money on those allowable expenses that we talked about above. Um, it was available for regular businesses and sole proprietors and independent contractors. It sounds so simple. What could be easier than that? Well, the devil of course is in the details and we're gonna get into some of those today. So I'll, I'll turn it over to the, the devil guy. He can start talking about some of the details. So Brian. <laughs> so you get to be the captain of cool and I'm the devil. Okay. so. Um, we we'll talk a little bit about some of these complications that we've run into since PPP was initiated. And, you know, one of the things that, that we've heard a lot of complaints about is that the processing of, you know, of the loans were really slow. Uh, some people have applied for their loans right at the very first day and, and still, um, well, I have, I have a friend that applied for a loan. He was an independent contractor on the very first day it was available and he just got his loan documentation to sign today. So, that, that slowness has created some other issues. For example, a lot of people 
had to release employees who went on unemployment. Um, the fact that unemployment uh, is a separate uh, you know, initiative act where $600 a week was added to you know, people's unemployment checks until July 31st, puts it in direct competition with bringing people back onto your payroll. Um, <clears throat> the definitions of what a full-time equivalent has um, never been defined. So, you know, that is a, is a complication that Dan will go into a little bit later and he'll talk about that. And then um, we've had misinformation or poor interpretations of information from well, sources all over the nation. Pretty much anytime you pick up your, your, your phone or your tablet and, and look at the news, you're, you're probably reading something that is misquoted or, or incorrect, um, you know, including uh, another one that we'll go into, which is the IRS um, challenging the tax-free status of a PPP loan. So. Um, let me talk a little bit about unemployment and then we'll go into some of the other ones later. Um, if you have people who are on unemployment, the focus of PPP was to get people off of unemployment. So the, the idea of PPP is to uh, bring any of your unemployed or laid off staff back on to PPP. So if they were on unemployment prior to the day of your PPP signing, that has nothing to do with your PPP. So the the eight week period starts the day you get your money and runs from eight weeks from there. Uh, so if somebody was on unemployment prior to that date, um, you know, you can you can bring them on and um, you know Dan will talk a little bit about that. Uh, some some rules to go by. Um, in a in a few in, in just a, in a minute when I turn it back over to him. So <clears throat> the unemployment folks who are on unemployment, their their claim end date should be the date that you recall them. And uh, Dan will go into recall methods here in a minute. Um, and then for maximum loan forgiveness, uh, you need just to be really the first day of your PPP so that you will be applying all of their payroll data over the eight weeks, and they will be you know. Uh, working for you during that time to come up to your full-time equivalent number. Um, and then if the eight-week period of PPP expires and we're still in the midst of COVID, um, they will be eligible to return to unemployment. Um, so if they refuse to return back from unemployment, uh, you may hire somebody to replace them um, and you're not required to reserve their position. And uh, with that said, I'm going to turn it back over to Dan because he is going to talk about a lot of the nuances of that. Um, one, of, one, of the, one of the issues we have is, is what's a full-time equivalent. Um, it's one of the major tests that you need to meet to get 100% loan forgiveness, and there's no clear definition. Um, there are, I mean, is it a 40-hour-a-week person? There are even uh, some... IRS rulings that say a full-time person could be as low as 30 hours per week. So what is the definition that the SBA is going to use or have the banks use to uh, determine what an FTE is? We don't know. Um, we've asked the questions and we haven't got a firm response. Our, our best advice is that you should use the historic basis that you've always used. If you have employee manuals that defines what full-time is, um, if in your calculations, when you first filled out the loan application, you had a definition you were using, you should try to adhere to your own definition and be consistent from the past to the present. Um, at some point, the SBA may release a, a firm definition. Um, they have every morning we go to their website and check and there's new answers that come out, but that answer hasn't hit that website yet. Um, we also have a, a lot of clients who who filled out the FTE number incorrectly on their application. Um, the application was not very clear. There was not a lot of guidance. And you know, we people we had people who counted a part-time person as a as a full headcount. Um, you're, you're gonna have to try to get that corrected. The, the 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 organization that you have to get that corrected with is the bank who made you the loan because it is the bank who will ultimately determine your level of forgiveness. Um, we know it's near impossible to get together with some of these bankers. So start preparing your, your data now so that when you do have the opportunity to talk loan forgiveness, you can say, look, here's what that calculation was. 
here's why it was wrong, here's what the right answer is, and here's how I'm calculating it consistently going into this forgiveness period. Um, there's also language about FTEs needing to be returned to the historic level by June 30th, and there's, there's real questions around what that means. Um, there is in the CARES Act, there's two time periods that you as a borrower can choose from. It's your right to choose which time period you want to use to calculate what your historic level of FTEs was. Um, those time periods are the first two months of this year, January and February of 2020, and the, also the time period from February 15th to June 30th of 2019. You get to choose. So if there's, I have many seasonal businesses who have very low unemployment or have very small number of employees in January and February, and it's to their benefit to choose that time frame to calculate their historic FTEs. Um, there's also a lot of discussion around the, the document says, as long as you return your FTEs by June 30th, you will pass this test. Well, what does that mean in reality? Does that mean I can bring somebody back on to my payroll on June 30th, pay them for eight hours, and they're gonna count as an FTE? There may be a reason to believe that's true, but we do not have firm guidance, and we're still seeking firm guidance on that point. Um, there was also a recent, just this last week, or maybe it was even this week, the days do blend together. Um, the uh, SBA did release further guidance on if you offer to rehire an, an employee, and if they refuse to return to work, you can count them for your FTE calculation as if they had returned to work. Now, you're gonna have to document that. So you're gonna wanna have a written letter or a written email to that employee offering them jo their job back and as much data as you can on that they re they refuse to return, um, you'll be able to count them in your FT, which will help you with that part of the test. It won't help you with the dollar calculation because you won't be paying them if they don't return. So it won't help you with the pay total payroll cost calculation, but it will help you with your FTEs. So that's a little bit of the about the status of FTEs and where we stand with that discussion. And then I will go back to Brian. Hey guys, before yeah, you, yeah. hey Brian, before you start talking, um, there's a question about what an FTE is. So full-time employee, just wanted to full-time equivalent. Full-time equivalent. So, so traditionally, uh, you know, I, I would think in my business, well, what's a full-time employee? They work 40 hours a week. So somebody who works 20 hours a week would be a 0.5 of an FTE, and somebody who works 10 hours a week would be 0.25 of an FTE. But the the confusion here is is what's that basis? Is it really 40 hours? Or could it be as low as 32 hours or 30 hours? Um, clearly you can defend the 40 hour. So if you do your calculations on that basis and it works for you, great. Uh, nobody will ever question that. Um, but there may be an opportunity to do it on a lower basis, but we can't advise you that there is yet. Yeah, and where the 30 hours comes from, Susie, is the Affordable Care Act uh, allowed full-time equivalents to be as low as 30 so that they would qualify for uh, health care. So um, that number has popped up is that some companies do in fact FTE at 30 or as low as 30 um, because of the Affordable Care Act provision. Okay, so um, yeah, let me go into a little bit about this bit about the IRS. And so it was, the whole thing was taken out of context when you think about um, when they passed the PPE and the provisions of the CARES Act, it said that that, that number would be tax-free. Uh, and of course, the IRS says, no, that's, that's not how it works. And of course, the IRS is 100% completely correct that it, that's not how it works. So if you get money from the PPP, in order for it to be forgiven, you would have to have expenses uh, against that. So so you got $10,000 and then you had $10,000 worth of payroll expenses against that, then your PPE would be forgiven. But your income statement would show, um, you know, that there was $10,000 taken in and $10,000 expensed and the net sum would be zero, therefore no tax. So th this, this whole piece was taken out of context. And let me kind of go through 
um, in, into the weeds a little bit about how you should document your PPP when you get it uh, in your accounting system uh, if you if you have such and if you're using a spreadsheet then um, you know I'll, I'll kind of give you a little bit of advice on that too so in your accounting system when you get the money you will deposit that in your bank account that will go in your cash account now the offset of that on your accounting system will be a balance sheet transaction creating a loan so that's a debit of cash and a credit to the loan that you've created on your on your balance sheet now during the process of the eight weeks you'll be booking your expenses at some point you'll go to your bank you'll go to prove your loan forgiveness whatever the loan forgiveness is will then become a new transaction they'll forgive the amount you will debit the amount of your loan by the forgiveness if it's 100 percent then the loan will disappear and then you will credit the other amount on your income statement to other income and that will offset the expenses that you have been reporting over the last eight weeks so you'll see when this happens is that whatever you actually expense will be offset by the income of the forgiveness anything left will be left in the loan account on your balance sheet which then you'll go through the process of paying that off over the next 18 months uh, and that's how the whole system is going to work is that whatever you get in PPP you're going to have six months to reconcile that with you'll have eight weeks to spend it six months to reconcile it with the bank get your forgiveness figured out and then from the seventh month is when the first payment will start if you in fact do have a loan document during that six months you don't have to institute a loan you can um, pay back whatever is not forgiven so i know that that is kind of crazy and complicated um so um, certainly if you have more questions on that um you know we, we we can cover that at length so let's talk a little bit about the other complication which is whether you have to spend the money, pay the money, incur the money. There's, there's lots of different terms about this um, and it's confused a lot of people, but the, the government bases everything that they mandate and your bank will certainly, I assume your bank will agree with this. Now we don't have clear guidance, but I'm going on general accepted accounting practices, GAAP, and GAAP is not a cash-based system. So when you bring people back, regardless of what your pay period is, the day you bring them back, they start working hours for you um, and or salary for you, and they start incurring costs on your books based on that hours or salary. Now, even if you bring them back and they're not working, you should be booking the associated payment to them. So if, the, if you bring them back on PPP and they stay home and do nothing, which there's, there's nothing in the PPP that says the employee has to be productive. You just have to bring them back and put them on payroll. So you would accrue their payroll, the incurred cost of their payroll, um, because it's happening, not necessarily being paid. You would pay them on your regular scheduled payroll. If you have a payroll provider, great, because they'll give you a report at the end of all this that you can give to your bank. If you don't have a payroll provider, then you're going to have to um, make those uh, documents that you provide your bank, starting with the day they give you the loan and the effort people are putting in and the amount that they incur in that will be paid on your payroll. And then I'm sure the bank will also want you to show that you have paid it, which may be a few days after um, because of the typical lag in payroll. Some people don't pay uh you know folks they're two weeks in arrears so you, know, you can't expect to cash out on the the last day of the eight weeks in order to hit the cash quotient that doesn't even make sense so um again there's there's very sketchy advice on this there's a lot of um advice coming from many many different areas um uh, that is kind of crazy uh, one CPA firm, for example, actually suggested that, well, just tell the bank that you don't start your PPP until the beginning of your payroll period. And that is specifically against the guidance of PPP. PPP must start the day that you get the funds. So you can't negotiate your start date. Um, 
And because of that, we suggest that you do this based on GAAP. Your bank should fully understand this because all banks work on GAAP um, and incur the cost from the day that you're, uh, you get your funding for eight solid weeks. So if you got your funding yesterday, June 30th would be your last day. And then you would close that out. You would pay them on the regular schedule. Maybe your, your uh, next payday is July 10th. That should be fine. Pay them as you would normally uh, and show all that information to your bank. Um, so back to you, Dan. Yeah, and I'll just add a little emphasis on that last point. Um, we have heard that some of the major uh, payroll processing firms, ADPs of the world, um, some of those guys have uh, specifically in their system that they'll be able to track this for you. And at the end of that eight week period, um, you know, give you that report. So if you have one of those, talk to them now. But if you're a small business like I've been many times um, and you're, you're doing this on your own, um, I, I would really think seriously about when that eight week period starts about doing a daily, a daily calculation of what your payroll cost was for that day, who worked how many hours, what their pay rate was, so that you'll have that level of documentation to present to your bank at the end of the eight week period. Um, I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to finish up and, and then we'll get into questions. Um, I, I will I will note that there's still a, a lot of things that we don't know in terms of how forgiveness is going to be calculated. Um, the Colorado Office of Economic Development has come out with an Excel spreadsheet. It's pretty easy to follow. We're going to send you that link out after this uh, webinar is concluded. Um, you can put your numbers in there and it will give you an estimate of what your level of forgiveness is going to be based on what you're projecting in this model. Um, Brian and I have reviewed that model. We think there's there's some areas where we're, we're not sure that we think they, they have the right assumptions in there in terms of how the SBA is going to look at this calculation. But again, none of us have specific guidance from the SBA yet. I will say that the model that, that uh, the Colorado Office of Economic Development has uh, put together in, in every case that we've been able to review, it, it takes the most conservative approach towards loan forgiveness. So it's gonna give you the lowest number of loan forgiveness if all the numbers in there are right, uh, based on its assumptions that it could calculate. We, we actually think that it may be, the calculation may be more generous than that, but uh, it's probably a good point to at least start with the more conservative approach. So we'll share that with you um, and, uh, and, and that'll, have, that'll, that'll probably spur more questions, but uh, we will share that after this uh, conversation is done. Cool, and I, I think that's, uh, that's kind of the end of our presentation. I was, gonna, I was gonna go into some of the specific things in that audit model, that's Office, Office of Economic Development, for those who wanna know what audit is, um, but uh, I think that's going into the weeds a little bit too much, so we'll leave that there. Um, and just leave that their their uh, assumptions are very conservative. Thanks, hey, Dan. Okay. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, so we have a ton of questions coming in. So if we don't get to yours, um, Dan and Brian are both consultants with us. Um, and there are 15 centers, like Susie said. So, um, you know, there's definitely opportunities to get some more assistance and answer some of these questions. So I'm trying to get through them as quickly as possible, um, but we only have about 35 minutes left. So um, I'll get to these as quickly as I can. Um, so there are some questions about self-employed. Um, I think you might have covered some of these, um, but People are wondering if um, they got the loan, um, are the spending rules the same for them? Yeah, I mean, the spending rules are the same. You can only spend it on those allowable expenses. You have to spend at least 75% on your payroll. Um, and for an unemployed person, that should be pretty easy. I think that the important thing is, is to document. I mean, uh, regular employees with W-2 employees are going to have payroll records and those sort of things they can submit. You're not going to have that as an unemployed per or a self-employed person. And as a self-employed person in the past, you may have just paid yourself at the end of every year and, and you report it to get the PPP loan with your tax returns. Well, I would, I would be more rigorous about that during this eight-week period. 
Um, I would I would track how many hours you spent on the business every day. I would track what rate you were going to pay yourself, and I would write yourself a physical check every week. Every week of this eight week period, I'd write yourself a physical check from from the business account into your own account, so you have that level of documentation to provide at the end. Yeah, and I think that's very important to show the transfer of funds. Okay, so this person received a PPP for their own company, but they took a job at another company um, before the 60 days or up. Um, so then can they still get forgiveness for that? Um, and what if they continue to work at their own business um, while working for another as well? It's an interesting question. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll hazard a guess at it. So let me let me just a lot of times I just have to restate what I think the person is saying. So they they were a self-employed person probably a sole proprietor or something. They got a PPP for that endeavor, their sole proprietorship. In the meantime, they went out and got another job working for somebody else. Um, so they're getting W-2 wages or, or some sort of wages from that other person. It, it's 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 a little tricky and, and, and they have to be careful. I, I would think if, if they went out and got a W-2 job for something, doing something totally unrelated to what their core business was, I mean, I'm not even sure it's, if it's that tricky. Um, my, my, my first blush is that I would think that yes, they could. So as self-employed person, I've worked, I've worked three different jobs many times um, to make end meets. And so if I'm paying myself out of my PPP for the duties I would have done for that part of my work life, then I think that's okay. And if somebody is paying me a check for another part of my work life, I don't think that's double dipping. I mean, you have to be careful that you're not paying yourself twice for the same thing because that can lead to problems. But so it really it really depends on the very specifics of that question. I think, Brian, I think there's a possibility it's okay, but you have to be careful. Yeah, and I think I would be very concerned with what is your intent? Um, because if the intent of taking the other job is to abandon the business, then I think that you could end up in big trouble with the SBA if you retain the funds on a business that you are intending to abandon. Now, if you're taking the other job to try to get through COVID uh, and you're going to keep that business up and running and your intent when COVID is over is to return to the business, then I think everything Dan said is true. Um, but you, you must be careful that you, know, you aren't, aren't looking like you're sneakily taking money from the government uh, when this is all said and done. Yeah, yeah. so it's really going to depend on the, on the very specific details. Great, thank you both. Um, are there any regulations forbidding an employer from increasing hourly employees' hours during the eight weeks? Um, they want to max out the employee's hours to maximize the use of the PPP loan, making sure the total payroll costs are greater than 75%. Um, employees may not be working all these hours in all cases, but they're trying to get the maximum money to employees through payroll. So I'll, I'll jump in and then I'll, so Brian is the CPA. So uh, when, when he speaks, he'll speak with a voice of greater authority than I, but so I'll start out and then let him fill in a little more CPA knowledge than I'm going to have. Um, there's, there's no prohibition against giving someone a raise, against someone working overtime hours and being paid overtime hours. Um, there's no regulation against in, in bringing on new staff. Like I've, I've used the example, well, I've always wanted to get my office painted, so I'm gonna hire somebody to come in and paint my office for the next two weeks as an employee. There's no regulations against that. I think that our advice is going to be reasonable. Um, th there should be a reasonable test involved when you do these things, um, and you should be comfortable that you have a reasonable business explanation around wanting to get your office painted. I mean, that, that's a reasonable business expense. Um, so, so I would say, I would say that's you can you can do that. Um, there's also no language in the document that says that's going to measure anybody's level of productivity. For what you paid them for. I mean, we're all business people. We want our employees to be as productive as possible, but 
you in these trying times could say, okay, well, I'm going to pay everybody to do a day's work of self-improvement and meditation and work in, and working on themselves. And, and that's, that's a defendable thing for you to do. So, so I, I think the answer is sure they can do that. Yeah. And I, I, the only thing I would add is I would be very careful if you run into the realm of overtime because that's extra effort. And if there isn't effort, I would stay away from that. Good test of reasonableness. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this person had to close their office, um, so they no longer pay rent to a landlord, um, but now they're using their home office. Are they able to use um, money from the PPP to pay for you know, their own mortgage? I'm, I'm gonna let the CPA take the first whack at that one. <laughs> yeah, so, um the the taking of space in your home office and applying it to the ppp would be really on the fence um what you're going to have to do to justify that is um look at all of your bills for your home so it would be your home um mortgage uh interest your utilities x number so on and so forth you're going to have to add all of that up uh come up with a number that represents the total cost of your household because when you're when you're doing um personal services buying from yourself you cannot just say hey i'm going to charge myself 400 dollars worth of rent it has to be based on real costs so you take all of those real costs and you add them up uh, on an annual basis then you take the amount of square footage that is attributed to your office that you can prove and show if you're audited and that percentage of square footage let's say that you're using uh, 100 square feet for your office and you have a 2000 square foot house that would be five percent of that total cost could be attributed and then you would have to break that five percent down by week and you would have to pay that to make sure that you could include it and you would have to keep all of those records in order to prove it. And, I, and I'm going to just throw in, and I was trying to check it as, as Brian was saying that, and I, I think that would have kind of been my first answer too, although he said it better than I did. I mean, you have to do all those things you have to do to declare um, your office on your tax for tax purposes. Um, there might be specific language in the CARES Act that says uh, the payment of rent have to be on rent applications for which there was a contract prior to February 15th, I think. Um, so yeah. I think that is in there. And so that would that would preclude, I think. Brian, does that sound right to you? I, I'm yeah, gonna, no, I'm, you know, the funny thing is, is I was telling somebody how to calculate that, but the, the, the fact is, is that if you did not have that obligation prior to February 15th of 2020, then it's not an obligation that you can count. So yeah. that would negate that. So really their only option um would be within reason uh, maybe to give themselves a raise um to cover the additional costs or claim only the payroll costs and give the the 25 percent over the top back that, that is one of the options that we should be clear to everybody when you when you do these calculations if you don't qualify for 100 percent forgiveness you're going to end up with a, a, a balance that's going to turn into a loan, but for which there's new, no prepayment penalty. So if you do your math correctly, know what you can spend it on appropriately and don't want to end up with a loan that you have to pay back fairly quickly at a low interest rate, mindful, but at a very quick pace, um, then be prepared to pay it back. Put it aside, let it sit in your savings account, and when you get that calculation of loan forgiveness, be prepared to pay it back right then. That is, that is an option that a lot of businesses should, small businesses should plan for. Great. Um, so this person is a massage therapist. Um, they actually got both the PPP and the EIDL loan. Um, so they're in business with just themselves. Um, so they got $1,000 from the EIDL advance as well as the PPP. Um, the PPP actually went into their account um, the next 
day, um, which is nice. Um, but they're wondering how, you know, the EIDL and the PPP work together. Do they need to return the EIDL grant or does it become part of the PPP? Yeah, so the the EIDL advance is calculated into the PPP number. Um, so when it comes down to your total forgiveness number, uh, EIDL will be subtracted from that. Um, so using the example of um, they got $1,000 from EIDL, let's say they got $10,000 from PPP, um, it is... Um, Basically, at the end, once they prove 100% forgiveness, that $1,000 of idle will need to be returned. Or, or, or kept as a loan. Now, okay. will it be kept as an idle loan under a 30-year payback and a 3.75% interest? Or will it be kept as a PPP loan under a two-year payback with a 1% interest? We don't know. Yeah, and I think a lot of that depends on whether when the idle loan actually comes through, whether you accept it. Um, but we, like Dan said, we don't know which side of the fence that thousand dollars would be for you. Right. And this, this specifically, I want to, I want to clarify this specifically about the idle advance as opposed to the fuller idle loan. Um, so yeah, I mean the idle loan, the idle loan, the idle advance is forgivable with the exclusion of you get a PPP, then you have to pay it back. Um, but the idle loan, if you get that later part, it's a loan. Okay, so some people are wondering certain things that are included in payroll. So like is life insurance um, and those types of things, is that forgivable? Um, also with utilities, there's some confusion about what that includes as well. Um, so if you have any clarification there. Well, I have one of those written down right here because I was doing it with so utilities include electricity, gas, water, transportation, telephone, and internet. Those are those are specifically spelled out in the act. I don't know exactly what they mean by transportation, but it is spelled out in that document. Um, and and the and the the other items that you can add to payroll cost are pretty much pretty well spelled out in that document too. I don't have them in front of me, so I won't quote from them. But but I know certainly the the employer, the, the share of the insurance that they pay for their employees, they can include that in the calculation. Um, they can include state and local taxes that they pay on that. They cannot include federal taxes, but state and local taxes, they can include. And I think that's about it, but I don't have that list right in front of me. Unless Brian has uh, something else, yeah. Yeah, so I think you got it right. Uh, there's actually three IRS tax codes that are excluded from what you can claim. Um, there's codes 21, 22, and 24. Um, 21 is FICA and Medicare, so the employer's contribution to FICA included. 22 is about railroad tax, so that probably doesn't apply to anyone here. And then 24 um, is federal income taxes withheld. If an employer was somehow contributing to that, um, which I can't imagine that could happen. Because so generally you're going to take the gross wages, uh, the cost to run payroll, so your payroll service fee, your um, any of your medical contributions the employer pays on the company's behalf, any insurance contributions you pay pay on the employer's behalf. And, and you know, uh, so anything that it takes to run and process payroll and the and the fringe associated. You can in, in, include uh, contributions towards uh, IRA or pension funds too. I think so. Yes. That was the other one. Yeah. Okay, so with independent contractors, I'm wondering what documentation is required to prove that the funds were spent to cover um, the lost income. And then another person is asking if they could give themselves a raise as a sole proprietor up to the $100,000. Well, you can you can give yourself a raise, but it has to pass the reasonable test. So if you're making 50 and then you decide you want to make 100, that's probably not going to be reasonable. Um, but if you give yourself a 10% raise, um, you know, then that certainly would be probably considered reasonable in anyone else's eyes. Um, as we know, this is a difficult situation because if you're a sole proprietor or an independent contractor, you're probably underpaid. 
but unfortunately, um, you're not going to be able to give yourself a whopping big raise. You sh should be able to give yourself a reasonable raise. And then, like Dan said before, in terms of, of proof, um, you need to be writing physical checks and showing that you can, that you have dispersed this money uh, so that you have a trail of where that, that money went. Now, you know, as you know, as a, as a, you know, sole proprietor and stuff like that, like Dan said before, a lot of times you wait till the end of the year or six month period or something like that before you disperse funds. But uh, under PPP, uh, I think Dan's suggestion of writing yourself a check at the end of each week, tracking your hours, those kinds of things is a, is a very solid advice. Uh, and then if you're paying utilities, rent, so on and so forth, then you need to show, um, you know, the bills and the disbursement of the funds. Let me let me just throw something else in there that m maybe will give you comfort, but maybe shouldn't give you comfort. Um, at the end of the day, you're gonna you're gonna apply for forgiveness to the lending institution from which you got this loan. Um, that lending institution is going to make the determination of what your level of forgiveness is. Now they're gonna they're gonna require documentation. They're gonna want to make sure that it's supportable. But the lending institution does not want to really end up with a loan to you at one percent interest for the next two years that they have to administer. It's it's to their advantage for you to qualify for 100% forgiveness. So we, I think our advice is we don't know all the rules, but if you document well, if, if you have good books and records, the lending institution is gonna wanna try to find a way to honor those books and records, you know, within reason. They're not gonna, they're not gonna let you create things out of thin air, but, but good documentation should go a long ways towards uh, towards getting you forgiveness. Okay, there have been several questions about people who haven't laid off employees yet, um, but they foresee that they might have to after the eight weeks expire. It's, it's an eight week loan, it's an eight week test period. What happens on day eight weeks plus one has nothing to do with the loan forgiveness. Um, uh, so, so if they have to, they have to, and, and those people will be eligible for unemployment when they do get laid off. Okay. So this person is wondering if they hire a replacement for um, someone who is refusing to come back to work. Um, would that, so the replacement would presumably be included in the dollars of payroll and FTE count, um, but could you also count the refusing employee in the FTE count? <laughs> That's an excellent question, isn't it? We don't, I, it's the first time I've heard it, and it's it's a natural question to come out of that. I don't, I don't know the answer. Brian, do you want to answer to guess or? Yeah, well, from everything we've heard, if you have a full-time equivalent that you offer a job back and uh, they refuse and you document that and you can prove it, then they're counted in the full-time equivalent. Now, however, because it is a three-tiered test, um, you're not paying them. So even though you may have, say, uh, one extra full-time equivalent, you still only have spent so much money. So, you know, you, remember, you have to pass all elements of the test in order to get full forgiveness. Sorry, just filtering through these. There's a lot of questions. Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> filtering through, I just wanted to add, and I don't know if we answered this part of the question, that that rehiring or hiring other people is certainly allowed under PPP. It is one of the provisions of PPP that you maintain um, and or you know rehire uh, or increase the number of employees. All of that is, is eligible with PPP funding. Okay, so this person, um, they have variable hours worked by their employees. Sometimes they are in excess of 40, um, and the historic period had the extra hours included. Um, so would the PPP payroll expenses also need to include the extra hours for forgiveness, or is you know the 40 hours sufficient? 
Well, if we, if we break down, I mean, there's, there's two tests, again. The one is the full-time equivalent test, um, and I don't think they can count any single employee as one and a half if somebody works 60 hours a week. So that, that's not going to fly. The most any one individual can, can, can be counted as a, is a one full-time equivalent. Um, in, in terms of the dollar numbers, yeah, I mean, if they, if they pay those people in this period, they incur those expenses and pay, it looks, it's going to count. Maybe, maybe I'm missing that point though, Brian. Yeah, well, well likewise, if, if, for example, if you had employees that are full-time equivalents that were making or being paid at 60 hours a week, that was the basis of how your PPP was funded, then um, you have to pass that dollar amount test, right? So if um, you know all of your employees are effectively working 60 hours a week, then your dollar value is going to be one and a half times your full-time equivalent. So you're going to have to meet that number. So does that mean that you have to pay those people for 60 hours a week when they return? Um, maybe. Yeah, and there's, there, is a, there is language in the CARES Act we keep focusing on this, at least 75% of it has to be for total payroll cost. There is language in the CARES Act that goes into if any individual employee is paid less than 75% what they were paid in the historic period, there's going to be a ding for that on an individual employee basis. Um, so so from that standpoint, if, if they, they traditionally work 50 hours a week and were paid on that basis, for you to meet that individual test, they're going to have to match up with their historic level of earning. So you're going to you're going to have to meet that requirement. Okay, so this person is asking if they increased the last PPP paycheck, would that be a red flag? Um, so I, I, I guess it would have a lot to do with what was the level of increase? Is it more employees? Um, did you just pay everybody double time to try to make the number right? I mean, so it's it's a red flag if it looks like a red flag. If it's it's a red flag if there's a justification for why you did it, um, or it's not a red flag if there's justification for why you did it. So the the question is kind of loaded, um, and uh, I I think you know you have to look at intent. Um, if, for instance, you get to the seventh week and you go, oh my gosh, I need to spend $10,000 on payroll this week, and you bring a lot of people in and pay people legitimately to make that number, um, you know, you're going to get asked, hey, why is your, your last payroll twice as much as the one before? And if you've got justification for it, I, then I think you're going to be fine. But if it's, uh, if it's a red herring, then it is what it is. It's got to pass the reasonableness test and the smell test. Okay, so if you increased your head count, um, so you're above your historical level of employment, um, can you count the cost of the additional FTE in the determination of the forgiveness? Well, you, you, can, you, can count, you can count their payroll. I mean, whatever, anybody you pay during this eight week period, you can count what you paid them towards your calculation. So the answer is yes. Um, and if you, you, you know, increase your FTEs from 10 to 12, well, you're gonna you're gonna pass 100% on that test. You're not gonna get any bonus for the two that you're over, except in the form of what you paid them. Um, so payroll will cost dollar for dollar. FT is just you have to meet the historic number, and it, but if you go over it, it doesn't do you any good on the FT calculation. Okay, so this person, I think they're in an unfortunate situation, um, but they are a retail store that is still closed, um, but they got the PPP, but they don't think they're going to open through May. Um, so they're wondering how that can work in this situation. There, there is a, yeah, oh, go ahead, Brian. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, well, I was going to say you have lots of options. And here's the thing, a lot of people, when they applied for PPP originally, they didn't know how it was going to work out. And it may or may not be the right option for you. Um, so you you may end up in this particular situation finding that um, not bringing employees back is a better option than bringing employees back. You can bring employees back. You can do inventory. You can paint. You can you know uh, clean. You can do all kinds of things if you want to. It doesn't necessarily have to to mean 
that you're doing something positive for, for the sake of retail. But the, the you, you have to weigh the decisions of how you want to do this. If you decide not to reopen, not to use the PPP, then at the end of the eight week period, then you can, you can forgive whatever maybe you paid yourself um, and then give the rest back. Um, you can bring half your staff back. So there's the, the, the forgiveness on PPP is proportionate to how well or how, how much you've spent during the eight week period. So a, as a business owner, you're at this point gonna have to make choices of, of what do you do with the money and how much of it are you going to use and, and how much potentially are you gonna give back or convert to a loan now remember, when you convert it to a loan, let's say you get $25,000 in PPP, you end up uh, giving 7,000 of it forgiven. That's a thousand dollars a month plus interest. So it'll be just uh, you know like a thousand and ten dollars a month. You're going to owe back to the SBA or your bank through the SBA um, a month for 18 months. A lot of businesses can't afford that kind of payment. I mean, I, I'll just throw in there's there's a there's a lot of businesses who this program didn't fit well for um, restaurants, uh, uh, salons, businesses that didn't have any productive work for their employees to do in this eight week period, but suddenly have a, an artificial requirement that they spend it during this eight week period. Um, it, it's not a good match for those businesses. So I'll tell you, there's a uh, a famous restaurateur in, in Manhattan. For those of you from Manhattan who've ever had a Junior's cheesecake. Um, the junior cheesecake guy, very notoriously, and he's been very open about this, um, received a, a PPP very early on. He had nothing for his employees to do. He very publicly said, look, I'm going to put this money in my savings account. And if at the end of the eight-week period, if during the eight-week period, I can start bringing people back and pay them, I'll do it. But if not, I'm going to be prepared to hand the money back at the end of the eight-week period. Um, there's been a lot of people who've tried to push Congress and the powers that be on letting this eight week period get extended. Maybe it could start later for certain businesses that aren't, many aren't are required by law not to be open. Um, so maybe they could get a later starting date. Um, there's been a lot of discussion on that. There's been no movement on it. Um, and, and you certainly can't count on there being any movement on it. So, I mean, that, that that's an option that you just be prepared to give it back. The, the sure advice that we can give you here is if you do not spend it for payroll, do not spend it. And it should be there when you go to justify it with your bank and then make a business decision of whether you want to make it into a loan or pay it back. Right. Now, and, and again, the second side of that coin is if you can get an idle loan, which are moving much slower, uh, but the, an idle loan is, is a more typical loan. It's it's not You're not going to get it forgiven, but it has decent repay, it has good repayment terms. Um, you can use it for a broad category of expenses. It's less restrictive, there's some restrictions, um, but that's really the, I work with many businesses, that's really the loan they need. Um, the PPP doesn't really work for them. It's the idle loan that they need. Okay, this is a logistical question. Um, would you recommend putting the PPP money that you receive in a separate account? No, I, I honestly, I think that this complicates, we, and we've seen several CPAs uh, give this information nationwide. It only complicates your accounting system. Put it in your business account, use it the way you do your business, show expenses. It, they're not gonna be looking at your, you're not gonna send them account statements. You're gonna send them, you know, payment receipts and checks and things like that. So moving it to a different account, all you're doing is, is complicating your system for an eight week period that's it, it, that's unnecessary. Okay, kind of another logistical thing, but they're wondering how they will be notified to apply for the forgiveness. They're just not sure what that process is going to look like. The, the language the language in the CARES Act says that you have to ask the bank for forgiveness. Um, so you have to affirmatively go to that bank and say, okay, I'm, I have my documents ready. I'm ready for you to consider them. Um, and and the, the original CARES Act said that the bank then has 15 days to give you a decision on your forgiveness. Um, I recently saw a guidance that I think increased that to 60 days. So they have some period of time to look through your paperwork and ask you more questions. But but you have to, um, you have to approach the bank for that. Um, hopefully by the time we get to that point, 
many of these rules, these questions will have been answered. The banks will be a little more comfortable what they're going to want. Maybe they'll have some guidance that they'll say, okay, when you're ready to apply, here's what we want. I don't think anybody has that now. Maybe they won't have it then, but we can all dream. So. Okay, this person is wondering um, in terms of the calculations with the limit of $100,000 for employees, um, if they previously earned more than that, how does that work in the um, calculations? Um, in other words, they'd be paid by some non-PPP funding source, but I guess that's how they'd report that. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're still capped by the $100,000 limitation, you know, which is $8,033 a month. If they're making more than that, then that's not going to help you with forgiveness if you're paying it. Um, and so I, th there's no real good answer for this other than, you know, it will pay up to $100,000. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't mean you can't pay that person two hundred thousand dollars. Sure, you can, but only the first hundred thousand dollars are going to be the part of the forgiveness calculation for this loan. Okay, some people are concerned about their pay periods and the timing. Um, you know, with the eight weeks, if their pay periods are on a totally different schedule, um, in terms of you know if they paid on May third, but then they got the loan um, on the fourth, I guess, just kind of timing wise, if there are issues and how they show that. Yeah, and this is uh, one of the, the, the biggest questions that were out there. And of course, the, the solid answer is there, there is no good advice. So I have been referring people to use GAP principles because most banks follow GAP principles which means that it's by when the time was incurred and uh, which would result in payment later. So uh, for example, you know, you just ran payroll yesterday and you get your PPP today, um, then you know, you're, you're gonna start incurring payroll costs even though they're not paid. So you will, continue to to book your payroll the way you are is brian frozen um i think so brian's frozen yeah dan do you have an answer i mean i i, th I think brian was <laughs> was given the answer um we we think that it's going to be that you're going to have to document um, what payroll expenses you incurred during the eight week period. So my first day was Monday, John worked on Monday, I paid him $100, I'm going to pay him $100, but I incurred that $100 in the period, even though he doesn't get his check till the period's over. So we think you have to keep track of what was incurred um, and then be able to show too that, yeah, then I ended up, I did actually pay John after the eight weeks was over. Um, so you're going to have to pay both, but we think the calculation is going to be on what you incur during the period. Um, but, but I will just say there's confusion in the language in the CARES Act, um, and the SBA has been asked for further clarification on that. That was a CPA question. My CPA got cut off. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, so we're about up on time, um, but I just want to reiterate that I know there were a bunch of questions that we didn't get to, um, so we are still here for all of you. We do offer consulting at no cost. Again, Dan and Brian are both consultants with our Boulder Center, and there are 15 centers across the state, um, so I would recommend that you go to coloradosbdc.org um, to see what your closest center is um, and what assistance you can get there. Because I know we have people all over the state and we all want to help you um, through this time. Um, so, you know, this, is keep, this keeps changing. We're here for you. Um, we're updating things as quickly as we can. Um, we're doing these weekly webinars to try to give you the most up-to-date information. Um, so we will continue to do that as the information is unfolding. Um, but that's all I have, I think. Susie, go ahead, final thoughts. Yeah, just if um, any of you have any suggestions for future webinars, um, we're happy to take them because like I said, we'll keep, and like Jamie said, we'll keep these going as long as they're 
helpful. And thank you, Dan. And thank you, Brian, if you dial in and we can't <laughs> see you. You guys were awesome. And, um, well, I think we all learned a ton. So thanks, everybody. Yep. Good luck, thank everybody. you all. <laughs>